Well, welcome to the second day of our symposium. I'm very pleased that we'll be able to hear a range of papers today, uh, from uh, Bahrain to Egypt, onward to Syria. And today, this morning, I'm especially happy uh, to introduce some of our younger scholars who are out in the field and doing um, incredible work. Our first speaker today is Nama Khalil, and she was actually in Egypt uh, this summer for the uh, coup revolution. So I'm sure she'll be speaking about some of the materials that she found. So Nama Khalil is an activist, artist, and academic. She received her Bachelor in Fine Arts from the Cleveland Institute of Art. Her thesis exhibition was derived from her personal experience exploring instances of silenced and suppressed voice in post 9-11 society. She explores the notion of otherness in her work while attempting to speak for herself as an other or acting as a mediator between her subjects and viewers. Her work has been exhibited in numerous galleries in the Cleveland area, Michigan, and in online galleries. In 2009, Nama curated an exhibition entitled Another Way of Looking, Influences from Islam. Nama is also the co-curator of Creative Descent, Arts of the Arab World Uprisings, now on display at the Arab American National Museum in Dearborn. So I'm very happy to introduce her as my co-curator today. She received her master's in Middle East Studies in 2011, uh, 2012, excuse me, from the University of Michigan, and she's currently pursuing a PhD degree in anthropology, also here at the University of Michigan. Her scholarly interests include transnational Islam, visual culture of the Muslim world, and identity politics and art in Arab American and Muslim American communities. So please join me in welcoming Nama. Thank you, Christian, for that wonderful introduction. I'm really happy to be part of the symposium today, and I'm gonna just be focusing on, on, on one image and its impact, um, how it initiated and how it spurred reaction and then its afterlife. And I, I'd be really interested to, to hear your thoughts so we can have a conversation about this afterwards. And so the title of my talk is Performing Resistance, the Iconic Case of the Woman in the Blue Bra. In the months following the ousting of former President Hosni Mubarak, December 17, 2011 marked a violent day of clashes between protesters and Egypt's armed security forces. A photograph of a veiled woman dressed in an abaya shows how she was brutally dragged, stripped, and kicked, exposing her bright blue bra. In this presentation, I will unpack this photograph and its visual responses by discussing how the event the photograph documented produced a spectacle by mediating social relations. Central to this argument is the semiotic process that generated a local public by making the blue bra into an icon. Through this photograph and several iterations, we see how women's bodies become the terrain for a national rhetoric around state-sanctioned violence and critical dissent. The power of this image first and foremost, comes out of the medium of photography and its association with evidence. The realness gives the photograph authority to act as a witness to the occurrence it captures. Thus, if reality is somehow present, external to the body, and available for recording, the photograph offers an accurate reference of that reality. The act of recording is made possible by the bodies present in public space, and in turn, the images act as testimonies to the body's presence. Thus, when the body is performing in space, it provides a sense of synergy between protesters and the transmission of protest. However, what happens when the protester is forced to stop performing? What other aspects of performativity are explored? And how does affect play a role in having us understand how the physical body experiences this coercion? These are some of the questions that, that I would like to be discussing. What we see here is a trace of a woman who was violently treated by male security forces. However, we do not know who she is. The realness of this brutality is one factor of the image power, but the other is the figure's anonymity. This woman remains nameless and faceless. Not only is she literally stripped, but she's also figuratively stripped of her own personhood. 
Nonetheless, this anonymity allows for a potentiality in understanding how the image and the social world together are conceptualized. The beatings ensued by the soldiers is an act of defacement. In a religious society where both Christians and Muslims believe that a human body is God's creation, when a body is then defaced, a surplus of negative energy is aroused from within the defaced thing itself. The defaced body becomes the center of action, and I quote, it brings insides outside, unearthing knowledge and revealing mystery, end quote. The act of defacement is ultimately an act of negation, which then forces us to speak about this woman in terms that is continuously dissociating her from her own body and self. In this process, the defaced body becomes animated and what was supposed to remain hidden, her blue bra, is not only revealed but creates a verbal and visual code. This woman is referenced as the woman in the blue bra or the blue bra girl. The blue bra, which is the revealed mystery, is used to index this photograph, the event, and the individual. <clears throat> An interesting paradox ensues. In its destruction, the act of negation is used to construct. The physical break of a body attempts to establish a different kind of social per person. Linking sociality to the material body alters notions of personhood, self, and identity. This is a relational exchange established by the state apparatus. Soldiers here are used by a repressive regime to violently intervene in public discord through the notion of discipline and punishment. So here she's actually physically being punished and disciplined to act in a certain way and not to protest. The continuous physical violence for some, the ongoing structural violence for others, and the psychological knowing of violence for everybody else is directly linked to the kind of pain and trauma this anonymous female is experiencing and has experienced, right? So she's continuously experiencing this. However, I argue that this woman is not without a voice. The pain experienced by one person here who is defaced and remains anonymous speaks to a collective, which in turn attempts to speak back in relation to her. We see this idea and thread of pain, trauma, voice, and nation as interwoven icons and messages in each of the visual responses to this photograph. The iterations that I will be discussing shortly signify a symbolic utterance, one that transcends the physical street to convey collective sentiments of a nation. This is what sociologist Asif Bayat calls the political street. It signifies shared feelings and public judgment of ordinary people and their day-to-day -day practices, which is often expressed in the public arena, in taxis and buses and shops and in, and in mass demonstrations. The iterations that follow take the form of mimesis as it renders a regime of visibility through the ways of doing, making, seeing, and judging. The images attempt to mimic this original photograph, but none are true representations. They become indexical to the image and to the event. It is through these iterations that people speak to the woman in the blue bra, express concern for the weakened nation, and foreground the necessity of memory. The woman in the blue bra prompted the public to react. This record of emotive moment is a flesh and blood human being who returns to haunt Tahrir Square, a square surrounded by symbols of state power that Egyptians are protesting. As a banner, as we see here, of an Egyptian women's movement, feminist groups in Egypt use this image to speak against violence that emerges in struggles over citizenship and belonging vis-a-vis -vis the state. While other women marches amplify their voices using a newspaper where the front cover is the image of the woman in the blue bra. Having the image reproduced as reportage further adds the, to the authenticity of the photograph. In both of these cases, we see how the body is an aggregate of the material world, an image which acts like other images. It receives and it gives back movement. The bodies gathered in space, like we see here, um, are actually receiving pain and trauma vicariously through the photograph they are carrying. It is also as if they were beaten and violated, as well as the woman herself. Thus far, the photograph of the woman in the blue bra was mechanically reproduced on a banner or for a newspaper. This next iteration attempts to mimic the image through the medium of drawing. 
Using markers and pens, the artist attempts to remain true to the image by positioning the female body and soldiers similarly. Um, where's the, sorry, how do I, the laser? Okay, so I'm just pointing out that you still have the three soldiers and, and the body being, I can't find the, it's right there. <laughs> the laser pointers is giving me a hard time. Um, Okay, so similar to the previous iterations, this drawing is meant to be magnified and reach a wider audience as it travels through time and space. It becomes an object used in the form of resistance um, because he's, he's holding a poster and is actually in Tahrir Square. And I can't point it out, but it's, it's in the background. You can see the bust and, and the museum. Right, okay, there we go, right, right there. Um, okay. So emanating from the drawing is text that reads, Tontawi, keep your dogs away from me. The relation of the image to the text allows the poster and the woman herself to speak loudly and boldly, demanding Tantawi, who is the military general in 2011, um, to listen. Interestingly, the signature on the bottom left corner belongs to Muhammad al nurkashi So you can see the signature right there. Uh, from this, we can conclude that a male designed this poster, presumably the one who's carrying it, and a gender dynamic then adds complexity to the scenario. Although the image on the poster is gender specific, the response is not gender exclusive. The text above the image demands Tantawi to remove his dogs and soldiers away from me. That is the word that is being used in Arabic. In a metaphorical sense, me would refer to the woman in the image as if she's the one making the demand. But it could also refer to the young man himself who is carrying the, the poster. And in that case, it would extend to anybody who, who reads this poster out loud. If I say, Tantawi hush kalabak anni, Tantawi remove these dogs away from me, then I'm also telling Tantawi to, to do the same. Thus, the trauma narrative initiated by the woman in the blue bra continues to include both men and women. So what we have here is an example of the power of presence, a collective assertion that attempts to discover new spaces that could be heard, seen, and realized. The next three iterations further establish this presence through their placement on walls as a site of contestation. This mural reads, we will never forget, O beloved of lady. So you have then a, a painting that tries to mimic the original photograph and up here it says, Mushanin sayasit al banat. Um, and the soldiers in this case are portrayed more fiercely and unhuman-like, almost robotic with red raider eyes. Um, and it was also interacted with further. I took this photograph this past summer, uh, and you can see how devilish horns are added. The eyes become, you know, almost rabid dog-like, and then you have these devil, devil tails um, to the three soldiers. Okay, so we, we still have the same notion of anonymity because the face of, of the female is still covered, so her identity is still concealed. We don't know who she is. Um, the positioning of the body here is, is, is slightly different. She's not completely on her back. You could see her arm kind of laying on the floor in an attempt to getting up. So the artist here gives the woman a little bit of agency, unlike the other images that we've seen. Choosing to paint this image on a wall is very deliberate. Taking the image to the streets allows it to summon a recurring public. It speaks to everyone and anyone who walks past it. Its visibility is not bounded by time in the same way that the newspaper and posters are, since they were carried in a specific location at a specific time for a specific purpose. Rather, its visibility here relies on the movement of bodies. Furthermore, the text written in relation to this image is in the plural tense, indicative of multiple people, a collective who by reading this phrase consciously claim that they will not forget what happened to this woman and in turn reflect on their own struggles. The language used in this iteration along with the others is in Korean register. Um, this previous reference, the Tantawi Hush Kalabak Ani is actually from a Haifa Wahbi song that has its own cultural meaning that I'm not gonna be able to get into. But, but the point is, I mean, it is a local register that is being used, which re then speaks to, to a local public. Um, colloquial vocabulary localizes both the images and experience, as well as establishes a language of cohesion. Furthermore, the deliberate reference of we supposes, 
presupposes a collective. The remainder of the phrase in relation to the image spec specifies the collective as an Egyptian audience, and more specifically, a local Korean audience. As a whole, when the text is read, it implicates a particular thing that should be remembered. In this case, the beating and stripping of a veiled woman. Furthermore, when seeing the image and reading the text, the viewer elevates this status and honor by calling her Sit al Banat, the highest and most beloved of respected of ladies. Most importantly, evoking the text aloud allows the viewer to speak directly to the woman in the blue bra. Another iteration that is painted in public and has a strong textual component is this one. Here we see a stark contrast in the abstraction of the bodily figures. The three bodily forms, this is one, this is two, and this is three, are spay printed in dark blue and meekly resemble the soldiers in the original photograph. They're almost scrouging uh, or doing something on the full one. One is kneeling over here. You could, you could almost make out a foot that is just being raised right here. Again, trying to reference the soldiers in the original photograph. Then there's an a, a, a amorphous form right in the center here. You don't have any other details besides the bra. So this is supposed to be the bra. Right? And the white space here is the abdomen, and then these become the woman's feet. Uh, her legs are right there. Um, um, so the process here is, is, is different than the others. It's actually, like the image is being drawn through abstraction, and uh, it's, a, it's, a sub, it's through the process of, of subtracting that the image is, is being created. Um, where did I, so, okay, so the cement then on the, on the, on the, on the, because this is actually on the ground. The cement is what fills the gaps of the female body, and uh, it's through the additive and subtractive process. That's what I was going to say. Okay, so the text beneath the image reads here, Tardahal ommak, Tardahal okhtak. So would you accept this on your mother? Would you expect, um, accept this for your sister? The invocation here is very gendered. And it doesn't simply reference the beating, which could happen to anyone. Rather, the text perpetuates a higher response because the person who is being beaten is a woman. Thinking that something like this could happen to my mother or my sister is meant to evoke a stronger response than my brother, my father, my friend, or even me. Although the message is personalized for a single response, it's not individualized. What I mean is, the text does not say, what if this happened to you, which would be a more directed message to the viewer. This way, the personalized message is one that is not gender specific. If a male or female passerby see this image, um, the invocations will still be the same. To have them think about their own loved ones. So it speaks to a greater, you know, multi co ed um, type of society. Interestingly, like the other iterations, this image continues the trauma narrative and attempts to link it to an entire society through, gender, through sisters and mothers. Through the iterations discussed thus far, we see a continuous abstraction that progresses from the initial image. And the detail of the woman's body slowly gets lost as the various mediums fades away the realness of the photograph. In this final iteration, we see a complete riddance of an eye, of an eye excuse me, of an, an unidentifiable female body. All this is left is the blue bra. It's stenciled and it's made into an icon. Unlike the previous iterations where motifs emerge through a visual continuum, the blue bra icon functions as a sign of a body that is configured as a clearly definable unit. Through this icon, artist Bahia Shihab puts the photograph back into the context of social experience and social memory. According to Charles Peirce, the function of a sign is to reference an object other than itself. The referential process is one that decodes the sign and allows meaning to be inferred from by the viewer. A sign does not become a sign without an audience who is willing to interpret the meaning. It is through the act of interpretation that a sign then can refer to an entity outside itself. So on its own, this blue bra really doesn't mean anything. If you put it you know, in the alley here, nobody's gonna know what it references. But in, in the placement of this, um, in the streets of Cairo, and also what Shahab has around it, which, which I will just shortly, uh, it becomes a sign because a certain audience is able to interpret it for it to mean something. So the blue bra icon pr presumes an audience who would understand what the stencil means, especially in conjunction with what's around it. All right. 
So what we have here is the word la. So this is no, and it's painted in black, and it's bold. Under it, it says um, no. So it's no to stripping of women. And then you have the bra. And then this is supposed to be a footprint stencil, which says long, li long live the revolution. Um, formalistically, the placement of the text here and here um, and the blue bra being in the center and also the point of attraction, that is what you see first. Uh, the outline in, uh, in its entirety, I argue that it also looks like a body. So the la really re replaces the woman's face. I mean, the idea of anonymity continues because at this point it really doesn't matter who she is specifically. But the point is that she's the one that is saying no. No directly to the stripping of people. Um, here is kind of the, the, the lower part of the body in the abdomen, and then, and then the rest of it is the footprint that is stomping her. Um, so semiotically then, the icon alone references the event. However, the surrounding text in relation to the icon also references a specific audience. Similar to the other visual responses, Shihab's use of the event as a reference point is then extrapolated onto an entire society and nation. According to Shihab, the blue bra reminds us of our shame as a nation when we allow veiled women to be stripped and beaten. This blue bra icon originated from a series titled A Thousand Times No. Shihab contextualizes her work as practicing art in revolutionary times, where she said, life stopped for 18 days on the 12th of February. We naively celebrated on the streets of Cairo, believing that the revolution has succeeded. Months later, as the reaction to the revolution turned violent and the country braced itself for a much longer battle, Shihab took to the streets again, spraying la, just no, on, on, on all the walls in Cairo that she could. So her series reads, no to military rule, no to a new pharaoh, no to violence, no to blinding heroes, no to killing al-Azhar sheikhs, no to burning books, and no to, no, to, no to barrier walls, excuse me, and no to stripping the, the people. Placement greatly influences the type of exchange that takes place between the image and the viewer. On February 15, 2012, she had painted a barrier wall with this series. Let me see here. This wall was erected in front of the Ministry of Interior to block protesters from accessing it. Following the uprisings, Cairo witnessed a localized zone that included several erected barriers and walls and, and tanks and wires um, to kind of control the movement of, of people. It's a form of spatial govern governmentality that Foucault talks about. Uh, and it's applied specifically in these cases to govern society and immobilize its citizens. The alteration of public space prompted Shihab and other artists to visually protest the wall along with the governance that established it. So then her work was, was kind of erased. We see that they left her a tribute in this corner. Um, and some artists came in and, and, and drew the street beyond the wall to pretend that the wall isn't actually there. And we have the figure of Handala here, who's the Palestinian icon of resistance, which also me, kind of references the secular left. I don't have time to go into detail about what this icon means and the placement of this wall. That's something we can talk about in the question and answer session if, if that interests you. Um, but then on January 25th, 2013, Shihab goes back and creates a mural of children of Asyut along with the Handala figure. So Handala still is there, but Shihab goes back and draws these children um, who died in a car, and, and a, they died a tragic death due to, due to a train who, who hit a bus in, in Asyut. Um, and so to Shihab, these children were killed by a corrupt system of governance. We started a revolution, so accidents like this would not, what would not happen again. Um, and so what she does is she then brings these children back to life and she has them play a game of hide and seek. So from this angle, the first child says khalawis, are you, are you finished hiding? The second child says lissa, not yet. Um, the third child here, you can't really make out the text, but he says, has the revolution succeeded? Then you still have Lissa, not yet. Did we get the rights of martyrs? Lissa, not yet. Um, has Egypt become heaven on earth? 
Lissa, not yet. To quickly recap, all iterations include the women of the blue bra, or the ones that just include the bra, act as an icon that is indexical to the original photograph, to this one, which allows which always provides a trace of the event. This generated a public that continuously questions the notion of citizenship. Here, Bahia added a layer to that signification. Initially, in her, in her just blue bra stencil, the bra was an emptied object of clothing, an amorphous form that is a, a reference to the woman who wore it. The symbol of it in, par in this particular mural becomes a defined form suggestive of women's breasts. Because when the artist actually left her tribute, this is the stencil of the blue bra right here. That is, that is what was left coincidentally, right? And so the placement then of this bra in relation to, the, to these children add another meaning to it. The icon stands in close proximity to the children, but not any children. Children who died a tragic death that arguably could have been prevented. The blue bra indexes the disciplinary beating of the woman. This beating hurt the very core of her personhood, which bred a collective crippling of both men and women and resulted in the harm of the children and the country's children. Here we begin to see the rupturing of Egypt's historic and, and long researched gendered national rhetoric. Misr, according to Beth Barron, is a gendered female and is stated to be the mother of the world. We you know when people say Misr Umid Dunya, Misr is, is the mother of, 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 all, of all worlds. Misr has a popular conceptualization of motherhood and then is perceived as a woman. Egypt's gendered history pinpoints national rhetoric, one that includes a family of foot soldiers, where the young sons and young girls are the daughters, and the father was the Watan, the homeland and the mother was the Ummah, the, the entire collective. This rhetoric still echoes true in Egypt's national discourses and some of the newest propaganda coming in support of Sisi have, have Abdel Fattah Sisi, the general military, you know, saving Egypt in a lot of political cartoons who is a woman. So, I mean, this national rhetoric is, is still being portrayed that way. But here I'm arguing that it's being ruptured. The female national rhetoric is one that needs to be critique and uh, Suad so Joseph is, is a scholar who, who does just that, and I'm just gonna quote her briefly here. The symbolic equation of women with nation often leads to the subordination of actual women through calls for the preservation of traditional families, codes of ethics, values, and conduct. At times, the reservation of a nation results in moves to assume greater control over women than had existed in some imagined past. What we see in these images is, is, end quote, now I'm talking, now this is my argument, okay. What we see in these images is how the perceived father and sons of the country here, they're not protecting the citizens, rather they're causing the pain and the suffering and loss. The children point directly to this. Not only is the nation's morale deteriorating, but its roots and infrastructure is failing. Although this accident occurred under the then elected civilian president, the system of the old regime is still to be seen in place. While the suffering and humiliation is being carried through time and space, Shihab not only brings these children back to life, but she prompts her audience to remember them by showing us what is at stake. How am I doing on time? Okay, perfect. I will then conclude. By following the blue bra, we see how an icon goes through multiple significations, an example of endless semiosis. What we have is a series of signs referring to the same object, this photograph. It started as a supersaturated image in which meaning was extracted. When the photograph became more and more abstracted, the blue bra became a simple and index that on its own is void of meaning until it generated a public engagement due to the image aesthetics, street location, placement, and circulation. Meaning has to be poured into it, and it was. The mode of, transport, of transformation here helps to pick signs that develop a kind of politics and aesthetics, which guides the audience to think about their own position in society. Each image incorporated the blue bra and demanded something through different forms of expression. 
The iterations gave meaning to the blue bra that differed from one another. In the process of, ex of expanding reference, the object is reconstituted at each stage. It does not depend on the previous series of signs. The independent signification that occurs establishes a new vocabulary through visual and verbal communication. All of the images call on federal citizens to strengthen their nation by speaking out against injustice, commit the beating of the women in the blue bra to memory, evoke a personal relationship to the event by repositioning their mother or sister in her place, and consciously be aware that others have been stripped so you can live decently. Thus, the blue bra as a symbol figures prominently as a highly condensed statement of moral concern, which transforms powerful spurs of emotion to action and memory. Each image become vessels that create their own narratives, a narrative that has an afterlife as we continue to engage them on the street or in a conference like this one. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nama. I'll ask you to hold your questions uh, until after Elizabeth's talk. Uh, I will maybe put the papers in conversation and then we'll open it up uh, to the floor. So our next uh, speaker, I will maybe pull up uh, your PowerPoint. This is yours. There we go. Wonderful. Our next speaker is Elizabeth Rao. She is a PhD student in the Department of the History of Art at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. She specializes in contemporary art and culture of the Middle East, Shi devotional and material cultures, modern Iranian visual culture, and contemporary art practices throughout the Islamic world. She's currently based in Muscat, Oman, completing pre-dissertation research on contemporary art and practices in the Gulf. So she has flown uh, from very far away to join us for this event. Um, I'd also like to add uh, to her brief bio that she curated a show with me on post-revolutionary Iranian posters some years ago, and she's also the author of its permanent online catalog. Uh, she's authored another article on the iconography of the Green Movement in Iran. And last but not least, uh, hearty congratulations to her because very recently she received the best graduate paper on modern and contemporary art at the Middle East Studies Association Conference that happened just about a month ago. So please join me in welcoming Elizabeth. Can everyone hear me? This good? Or should I speak from here? It's a little low. How's that? Better? It's now? Better? Okay. Um, thank you all for being here this morning. It's wonderful to be back in Ann Arbor. I'd like to especially thank the organizers of this symposium, uh, Christian Gruber, Juan Cole, and Nama Khalil for all your hard work. It's wonderful to be back in Ann Arbor, however briefly and however much colder it is here than in Oman right now. <laughs> so I will start today with a video. بدأت عملية تطوير دوار مجلس التعاون بمحافظة المنامة العاصمة تسهيلا لحركة السير والمرور في المنطقة المحيطة بالدوار وتأتي عملية التطوير للدوار نظرا لما تشهده المملكة من كثافة مرورية في تلك المنطقة التي تعتبر ملتقى لعدد من الطرق والمسارات الحيوية والهامة التي يقصدها معظم المواطنين والمقيمين وزائرين للمملكة يوميا في ذهابهم وإيابهم حيث أن دوار مجلس التعاون يتوسط المنطقة التجارية التي تقع في المجمعات ومقار عدد من المصارف والبنوك Iconoclasm is often defined as a destructive act In many ways however 
Destruction is not the end of an object's life, but only a transformation of its materiality. Rather than simply destroying a material presence, iconoclastic violence results in the material form's transformation into new meanings and practices. When cranes and bulldozers under government orders tore down the towering monument at the center of Bahrain's Pearl Roundabout, or Duwar al Lutlua, on March 18th, 2011, during the height of the 2011 uprisings across the Gulf and the Middle East, the result was not an erasure of the sculpture from physical or imagined space. Instead, the Pearl Monument was permanently installed as the absolute symbol of Bahrain's 2011 Pearl Roundabout protests and occupation. Along with intensifying its meanings and utility amongst activists, destruction of the sculpture led to an outpouring of creative activities in response to this devastating act that underwrote the final crackdown on the roundabout occupation in the days that followed. Suppression of the uprising was aided by Gulf Cooperation Forces, or the GCC, a political and economic consortium of Gulf nations who feared the spread of the 2011 Arab world uprisings to the Gulf, and thus encouraged the Al Khalifa ruling monarchy of Bahrain to cease the roundabout occupation at any cost. The end of the monument's existence in the physical realm propelled it into an imaginary space, one that proved ripe for harvesting as protesters have refused to forget the events at the Pearl Roundabout in spring 2011. In my presentation today, I will argue that these visual and material productions continually assert and revive the presence of the now vanished monument within Bahrain's public spaces and civic memory. In their attempt to vanquish both the physical and symbolic epicenter of the protests and erase the memory attached to the concrete structure, the government and GCC forces raising of the Pearl Roundabout produced the opposite effect. Inspired by the occupation of public spaces in Egypt and Tunisia, on February 14, 2011, young Bahraini activists utilized social media to organize a takeover of Bahrain's capital city's largest and most visible roundabout set in the city's bustling financial harbor. Dubbed the February 14th Coalition, this movement witnessed loosely organized youth groups unite for the first time with many of the small island nation's long-established opposition, opposition groups, such as al Wafaq, is as an extension of a decades-long struggle, struggle to institute a new constitution replacing the governing monarchy. The Al Khalifa family has ruled Bahrain and its majority Shi population since at least 1820, when they signed a treaty with Britain, who had been ruling the who had been the ruling colonial power in the Gulf since the late 18th century. Calls for widespread reforms, basic citizens' rights, and democratic reposition in lieu of a constitutional monarchy resonated across the roundabout's grassy knolls as the makeshift tent city produced slogans, posters, banners, and other rhetorical devices along with a speaker's podium that became a kind of speaker's corner for Bahraini society as protesters prepared to install themselves at the roundabout for the duration of the occupation. Occupying the Pearl Roundabout was in and of itself an important achievement for organizers. Indeed, one of the key challenges in all the Arab Spring protests was the need to overcome the urban planning in many Middle Eastern cities that offer open public spaces without associated production of social activities. This is particularly true in the case of the major Gulf cities where urban infrastructure has expanded exponentially alongside the region's petroleum boom. Therefore, a result of this hyper-modernization is a provision of open urban spaces, such as the Jawar al in the Arabian Peninsula that have no cultural memory of civic use. This is in contrast to the historic use of mosques and other religious spaces as sites of articulating political discourse and dissent. Also in the case of most Gulf centers, colonization never took direct form to the same extent as cities such as Beirut, Damascus, or Tripoli. Yasser el Shishtawi argues that cities and infrastructures along the Arabian Peninsula have grown free from historical burdens in asserting themselves as global cities. 
Thus, spaces such as the Central Pearl Roundabout were designed on European models that evolved through centuries of revolt and protestation within local urban terrains. Yet these spaces, as transposed into the capital city of Manama, carried no connotation of public use or performance of dissent. Of course, after the spring of 2011, this would no longer be the case. Two demonstrators were killed in clashes with regime, regime forces during the first day of demonstrations on February 14th. The next day, organized funeral processions were able to maneuver through Manama's crisscrossing highways in snarl traffic and government security apparatus to reach the Pearl Roundabout, or simply the Lua, the Pearl, as it was diminutively referred to during the uprising. Large demonstrations also took place across the capital city with the largest on February 22nd, estimated at hundreds of thousands of dissenters. Yet the roundabout remained the locus of the uprising. With the space's front and while the space's front and center location was no doubt part of its appeal to its occupants, the site's primary visual marker emanated from the milky white monument that towered over the tents and sleeping bags below. Erected in 1982 as a public memorial commemorating the third GCC summit in Manama, the roundabout's monument became the centerpiece of the Al Khalifa family's legitimizing narrative, embedded within a commemoration of Bahrain's allegiance with five other Gulf nations. The opaque cream concrete structure projected 100 feet into the sky. Six tapering boughs concaved upwards toward a horizontal disk that flanged the monumental structure. So here is the disc as the arches hold up to the sphere. Nestled at the top where the flexures blossomed was a large, perfectly round sphere. In representing a pearl, the sphere was held aloft by the six arches, much like a precious gem in a ring's bezel. The sense of the monument was one of both gigantism and minimalist grace. Officially named the GCC Roundabout, or Dewar Majlis al Tahwan, it later became known amongst Bahrainis as Dewar al Luhlua, the Arabic term for small, precious pearls from the Gulf, a fitting name for a site intended to memorialize and monumentalize not only the GCC, but to, but to facilitate the state controlled image economy by foregrounding, quote, traditional Arab culture. Rather than construct a monument to specific historic figures or events, the structure operated within the visual language and urban inscription of national and regional identity in the Gulf, which utilizes a mediated national historiography of Arab cultural traditions and authenticity. Thus, Bahrain's historic pearling industry became the symbolic regional locator of this transnational memorial articulating a specifically Bahraini tradition under the umbrella of a broader, collective Arabian Gulf. Besides the enormous pearl materialized in cement form, the monument's main body referenced the Gulf's famous dhows, or small sailboats from which pearl divers would jump into Gulf waters in search of the elusive luminescent stones. These sailing vessels once dominated oceans from the Gulf to the Indian Ocean, yet today mainly exist as part of a tourist industry. Echoing the curvilinear line of the cloth lateen sail, the ivory arcs recapitulated the form once visible all along the coastal horizon that the monument itself faced. Altogether, the monument alluded to Bahrain's historic pearling industry and rematerialized this particular history as part of its performance of modern national identity under the Al Khalifa ruling family. Most overtly, the matte, non-reflexive sphere privileged the minute and radiant pearl as a powerful object in Bahraini history. The small and rare was remade to mammoth scale in the ubiquitous urban material of concrete. Such rematerializations demonstrate the supplanting of Bahrain's previously prized export of pearls for the new national export of oil, which brought with it the wealth, materials, and infrastructures of globalization. In so doing, the monument affirmed the Al Khalifa regime with an idealized Bahraini past, while simultaneously celebrating the petroleum era that had brought booming economic growth, as well as deepening socioeconomic inequality to the island nation and its fellow Gulf states. 
Presenting the six GCC member nations as unified and equally standing arches, the countries were memorialized under a shared cultural heritage of the Gulf. The monument thus codified each nation arch as one integral support of a cooperative organization while subsuming the inhabitants of each Gulf state into an abstracted and homogenous whole. As the uprisings that began in Bahrain and later spread to eastern Saudi Arabia and parts of Qatar and Oman demonstrated, this idealized projection of the Arab Gulf does not reflect its lived reality. Clasping onto the monument's prominent position within the government's widespread self-historicizing campaign, the 14th February coalition positioned themselves under the most recognizable public sculpture in Bahrain to be seen and heard. In order to establish the tent camp around the monument, protesters used parked cars to create an outer barrier, thereby expanding the space and canceling out the roundabout's intended purpose to alleviate ve vehicular traffic flow. Securing this perimeter produced a makeshift city within a city, a breakaway republic with all the trappings of an autonomous city. Makeshift kitchens offered kebabs and tea to anyone who visited the roundabout, as curious visitors came during the day to hear the chants, speeches, songs, and calls to prayer that composed the everyday lived experience of the Pearl Roundabout's occupation. And I'll show a brief clip taken during those days to give you a sense with, with the audio to hear what some of these chants and singing were like. <laughs> People squatted in a public space while performing civic, civic activities in a way similar to demonstrations in Cairo's Tahrir Square, as well as the Occupy Wall Street movement's encampment in spaces such as Zuccotti Park in New York City. Photographs from the roundabout's occupation capture people enveloped by the giant structure, surrounded by it, and enclosed within its shadow. Through both physical proximity and visual documentation, the Bahrain uprising became inextricably linked to the tall monument and its encircling roundabout. Acting as a backdrop or a visual locating anchor, the monument's presence in images from the short-lived encampment juxtaposes its soaring three-dimensional form, transcending above the demonstrators' bodies and tent homes. In some images, the monument appears almost as a sentry a towering, faceless custodian of the occupation, keeping watch over the scattered people moving or sleeping below. This contiguous relationship between the concrete structure and human bodies would later be harnessed to depict the monument as embodying the occupiers themselves, and thus the spirit of the uprising. Dwarfed by the concrete structure, individual human bodies are thrown into sharp relief as the fragile, organic, and temporal beings they prove to be when faced with violent suppressionary tactics during the government's eventual crackdown on the 2011 uprising. Protesters also offered their own self-historicizing narratives at the roundabout, utilizing the site's newly dedicated purpose as a public arena for civic use and articulations of dissent. Activists sought to historically situate the roundabout within the country's decades-long history of opposition movements. Memories of past and present civic action were inscribed in the space, in some quite cases, quite literally, with graffiti on the monument itself. At one point, graffiti appeared renaming the monument as, and the roundabout as Duwar al-Shahada, which if you can see here, it's Duwar al-Shahada, or the roundabout of the martyrs. Turning the site into a memorial to those killed during the 2011 uprising, the graffiti tag co-opts the physical form and legacy of the monument from the government and instead claims it in the name of the deceased. Along with such graffito, there were posters of those martyred thus far, far and of a number of political prisoners from the uprisings. Other posters at the roundabout depicted martyrs from Bahrain's previous uprisings. Therefore, rather than allow the uprising to be characterized as a plot by foreign instigators, namely Iran or, or transnational Shia organizations, 
Activists claim the Pearl Roundabout protests and occupation as merely the newest link in a long chain of historic descent in Bahrain. The site of the Pearl Roundabout became the microcosm of the opposition movement, and the success of the Bahraini uprising was inextricably tied to it. In the process, demonstrators undermined the regime's attempts to formulate and disseminate a national symbol of the country's cultural heritage as one tied to the monarchy exclusively. By challenging this narrative, protesters challenged the constructed legitimacy of the Al Khalifa family while claiming the Pearl Roundabout and its newly consecrated civic and social space as their own instead of a cenotaph to GCC unity. National flags were carried and hung around the circle in demonstration of the uprising solidarity with all Bahrainis, eschewing the sectarian divides the government sought to exploit in order to turn Sunni and majority Shi protesters against one another. During these activities centered around the Pearl Roundabout, the meaning and symbolic associations of the monument were forever altered. What had been designed as a selective articulation of past heritage now came to symbolize the hope and possibility of change in Bahrain's future. These scenes of demonstrators gesturing towards the, or alongside the monument were eventually collapsed to produce the 14th February Coalition's logo. Casting the monument in black to denote its destruction, a white collective fist juts in front symbolizing the monument's shared embodiment of the coalition, and thus the uprising. The monument itself became a moment in history making. Now, unfortunately, all the promise of the Duar al Lua exists only through the distance of the photograph. Fearing the spread of protests throughout the Gulf, the Bahrain royal family was bolstered by the GCC, which included Saudi Arabian troops and United Arab Emirati police to deploy its forces as a concerted campaign of mass violence, destruction, and silencing ensued. On the evening of March 17, 2011, troops entered the Luflua roundabout, clearing the grassy circle below the monument of all opposition members and killing dozens. And you can see the troops entering the circle here. Then, on the morning of March 18th, Bahrainis awoke to a news broadcast on the state channel BTV revealing the demolition of the monument and the raising of the Pearl Roundabout. The government announcement stated that the monument had been, quote, violated and desecrated by the vile anti-government demonstrators, and thus it had to be cleansed, end quote. The foreign minister added that the Pearl Monument had to be destroyed to, quote, erase bad memories. In the haste to pull down the sculpture, a migrant crane worker was crushed to death by a falling cement arch. The image of the monument's destruction was photographed and broadcast as evidence of the regime's unassailable power. Televised during daytime hours, the Bahraini state sought to effectively demonstrate to as many Bahrainis as possible that the attempted revolution and its symbol had been vanquished. Construction crews had dug up the grass covering the roundabout and bulldozed the central fountain leaving behind only dry, churned earth. Bulldozers dug at the Pearl Ramp Monument's legs for hours before cranes pulled the six arches until the structure fell into itself. On the precipice of the monument's collapse, film stills capture the moment of the six arches falling apart as the cement pearl starts to tip from its resting place. Separated from their central axis, the elongated bows begin to look more like ivory tusks as they slide away from the fountain. This still of the event offers the last twisting gasp of the monumental object before it fell to wreckage. With its destruction, so too was the symbolic aim behind the destruction. References to the peaceful and united Gulf Cooperation Council were instead showcasing its support of the regime over the demands of Bahrain's own citizens. Since the roundabout and its accompanying monument's destruction, the image of the Luf Lua has continued to occupy the urban and mental landscapes of Bahrain. Despite the absence of its material body, the Pearl Roundabout's memorial sculpture is continuously referenced, rematerialized, and reanimated through a variety of media and materials. Demonstrations against the monarchy have continued over the past three years, despite continued efforts of suppression 
particularly in the Shi-dominated villages outside of Manama. Visual materials used in these rallies often proffer images of the Pearl Roundabout or its monument. Posters and digital materials insert an image of the monument, often alongside information for meetings or other street demonstrations, such as in this poster here. These continual references to the 2011 uprisings and occupation of the Pearl Roundabout reject the government's raising of the site as an end to the up uprising, while also expressing a longing for a return to the roundabout's encampment and the days when reform and even regime change still seemed possible. And so we have here a call for a return as well for our student rally in um, the one year anniversary of the uprising. Remanifestations of the monument are not confined to photographic reproductions. In the urban environment, spray paint tags echo the structure silhouette, often with the tagline adopted by protesters since they are forced to depiction from the roundabout, Samud or Perseverance, which you can see here, Samud, and here we have a small graffiti of a Fido of the roundabout, or the, excuse me, the monument. These visual incarnations signify the monument's presence within the physical confines of Bahrain, thereby defying the regime's hope for a complete erasure of the structure from the city. Quickly and easily produced with just a spray paint can, these graffiti signifiers also reanimate the monument, such as the one on the left with facial features. As they reanimate the monument by asking the viewer to see and identify these miniatur miniaturized shapes as the Luhlua, Indeed, as David Friedberg argues, the cognitive process recognizing an image of someone brings that image to life. So we are complicit by viewing this and seeing the monument and keeping it alive. In identifying the thin streaks of paint as the Pearl Roundabout's monument, viewers assure its reanimation and continued survival in this world. Perhaps most fascinating though, amongst these many rematerializations are the miniature models or maquettes of the monument that began appearing soon after its destruction. These handmade objects crafted from everyday materials range from handheld tableaus carried in demonstrations to miniaturized sculptures abandoned on roadsides. And I'm going to show two brief YouTube clips that depict these small sculptural maquettes within Bahrain and confiscation of them by Bahraini police. So in this video you see this one's about as tall as a person and they come up and are confused by it. <laughs> So they're waiting for a truck to come, which they will toss the maquette into and haul it away, thus um, repeating the act of destruction as well. Let me find the, here it comes. And there was a flag on top of it as well. So there it goes. And then I think I have a second video as well, or is it the same? Nope. Mocking the government's desire to eradicate the pro roundabout, miniatures of the monument rematerialized the structure's form, transcending the violence enacted upon it, and transporting the monument back into its vital materiality. As such, maquettes actually reclaim the monument from the regime's destruction of its physical shell, as these miniatures retroactively free it from its physical constraints at the Pearl Roundabout and carry it into an almost infinite set of po new possible arrangements and contexts. In this image, we can see a mock-up of the monument held aloft in a street procession. Blood pulls down at the base of a stabbed pearl atop the structure, as you can see here, 
there's a stab wound in the pearl itself, and then blood is dripping down at the base. As the sign calls for a Thorata Luthlua, or pearl revolution, stamped on the Bahrain flag atop on the right is the Square of Martyrs, which takes the renaming of the Pearl Roundabout as the Roundabout of Martyrs one step further by associating it with other martyrial squares, such as Tahrir and also the Martyr Square in Beirut. Alongside the monument, the giant V hand gesture, gesturing for peace across which is written the opposition's ongoing tagline, Samud, or Perseverance. Miniaturizing these rematerializations also allows activists to transport the monument in street demonstrations. Here we see a handheld maquette as what appears to be a votive offering with small candles placed around the tableau between its legs or arches, so here and here. Such candles are used to make offerings to the deceased and this ritualization of the monument inserts it into a religious sphere where the monument's embodied spirit coexists with the spirits of those killed during and since the 2011 uprising began. Freed from its material body, the monument can be revived time and again by activists who wish to maintain and honor the memory of the pro roundabout protesters. Miniaturization can also come in the form of costume as one small girl wears a miniature monument on her head with pink wings and the national flag emblazoned on her dress. As placed atop her head, the monument acts like a crown, one bestowed by the popular uprising, and thus displacing the royal crown of the Al Khalifa monarchy with the crown of the people. Reanimating the Luh Lua as an angel or ethereal form from an imaginary realm also demonstrates a continued life for the monument in the afterlife. Such ghostly apparitions are continued in an editorial cartoon of the ruler of Bahrain, King Hamid ibn Isa al Khalifa. Startled awake in bed, the king discovers to his shock a blue specter of the pearl monument hovering over him. In its afterlife, the monument has sprouted two arms and it waves its knobby hands over the king, threatening repercussions for its death. Here, the monument is anthropomorphized as the living dead, like a resurrected zombie promising retribution to great comedic, comedic yet also powerful effect. After the demolition of the public roundabout, the space was heavily guarded to prevent demonstrators from reclaiming the site. In the now nearly three years since that fateful morning, the Luh Lua has been turned into a nondescript road junction, spatially eradicating any trace of the monument, the open roundabout, and the former presence of the Bahraini occupation. And to this day, you are actually not allowed to even use the, the roundabout, the junction. It is completely blockaded by police, so it doesn't serve any purpose at all. It's just empty, closed off space that no one is allowed to walk across or drive across. The Al Farouk Road Junction presents a desolate re-territorialization of a space that had once been full of civic activity and optimism for the future. The Al Khalifa regime used every means at its disposal in attempting to eradicate the memory of the protests and their claimed monument. Yet this act of iconoclasm was not the end of the Pearl Roundabout, but only the beginning of new opposition activities. Rather than destroy the monument or the uprising, the demolition served to disperse the symbols and memory of the protests into new manifestations of discontent. The monument continues to occupy Bahrain through its multitude of visual and physical remanifestations, enduringly, resist enduringly resisting the state's efforts to erase it and all it came to represent. And I will conclude by showing you two images from yesterday and the day before in Bahrain, which was the Ashura processions, which take place amongst um, Shi uh, communities. And as you can see in the street procession, there is a large maquette of the, Pearl Monu uh, the monument from the Pearl Roundabout, which was processed in the streets along with this Muharram procession, which 
I don't have time to discuss the many, many aspects of Xi material and devotional culture, which have um, uh, so the Pearl Monument has essentially been placed within, but during Q&A, I look forward to talking about this aspect more. So thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, to Nama and Elizabeth, and please feel free to join us here at the, at the table. I will just uh, try to see some common uh, themes here throughout the two papers, and then I will put one or two specific questions to each of them, and we'll then open uh, up the, the floor for some other questions. I think these two papers are in wonderful conversation uh, because we can see that in both cases, whether we're talking about a body or a monument, uh, the end sometimes is only the beginning of something new. It's not the mark of a closure or an erasure, but it's uh, the catalyst of a whole range of performances that are typically visualized. So in these two papers, uh, what I find interesting is that we get to see the various methods of imprinting identity and memory through both personhood and objecthood um, in these uh, visualized and narrativized forms of trauma telling. We see affect and performativity, whether we're talking about the female body or a large concrete structure. I think in both cases, anonymity is a very important factor. Uh, on the one hand, the woman remains anonymous. She's never um, made herself publicly available. And a monument, by its, its very being, is also an anonymous entity. Uh, you can infuse both anonymous bodies, if you will, with a plenitude of potential meanings. And these are the kinds of vessels, I think, that both of you are, are speaking of. In some sense, uh, we've got depots, uh, very large depots of potential meaning, what you might call this endless semiosis, or the endless production of potential uh, indexical signs and meanings. So these acts of negation are catalysts for all of these generative products. And in these products, you see backtalk, um, a speaking back to those who have uh, harmed you, violated you, uh, decimated you, obliterated you, uh, turned you into something that is not supposed to be. So speaking back through rhetoric, uh, through images, is a forceful way of asserting being when that being is gone. Um, so there's an ontological, I think, value to this. Within the, uh, this kind of scenario, and I think in both of your cases, um, I see that you've got this forceful, haunting return as well of the image or of uh, the thing, right? So we've got these, these living dead, these ghastly simulacra of vanished bodies, of vanished uh, communities that emphatically uh, refuse to desist. Uh, so it's a question of a refusal to die um, by those who harness these, these uh, kinds of signs in the public domain. Um, another thing I thought cut across both of your papers is this notion of sympathetic pain. And I'll get to my specific question for Nama in just a, a second about that, that the, the woman and the monument um, have been hurt in some way. They've been violated. Um, and they've been beaten down uh, to a, a pulp, if you like. And so the, the people are called upon to feel that pain uh, and sometimes to avenge it or to rectify it in some way. So these. These individuals are coming together as an aggregate, as a collective. They're using these referential signs for these ongoing processes of reconstitution that perhaps ironically are only engendered through uh, this process of erasure or destruction. So iconoclasm means you destroy, uh, of course, icons, but something has to come in its stead. And in its stead um, is this omnipresence of that which is supposed to be absent. I'd like to now put uh, a couple specific questions to each of you. Um, first, for Nama, um, in this progression of the blue bra icon, what is very noticeable is that from the beginning to what you might call the end is an evident process of abstraction. Uh, you've got the disappearance of the physical body. The blue bra becomes an icon in itself. And I'm wondering 
whether you think that that process of abstraction uh, helps to distill specificity and so multiply the, the, the process of investing the icon with meanings that were not there perhaps initially. So I'm wondering whether you could speak a little bit about this, this process of, um, of visual abstraction. And then a, a much more specific question for the image where the viewer is, uh, is called upon to not have this happen to his mother. Uh, would you accept this if it happened to your sister? Um, even though the viewer might be also a female, I'm wondering whether um, you could enlighten us perhaps as to whether the viewer is male if this it draws upon a kind of male urge towards protectiveness where it's not just a question of controlling the woman's body, but the woman's body is also perhaps the locus of honor and protection. Uh, there might be perhaps a little bit more that you might want to, to say about that. For Elizabeth, what I find interesting here is that the GCC is replaced with a pearl, replaced with a fist, replaced with the deceased. So we have not so much a process of abstraction, but a process of, of new generations of, of meanings. And you touch upon um, the monument in a particular Xi register at the end, and I think this is really the great op a great opportunity uh, since we only had a, a very limited amount of time to ask you specifically about the monument's power and role uh, specifically within Xi performative culture, um, within, for example, Muharram processional performances. As many of you know, in Ashura processions, floats are processed, there are mock-ups, there are maquettes. Uh, there's a real materiality to, to memory in what some scholars refer to as object um, memory. And these objects are, are, are quite popular in Iranian uh, Shi Ashura ceremonies as well. And one last thing that just came to my mind as, as you showed those two images is that the Pearl Monument looks a lot like a tent uh, as well. And uh, she performances from Muharram include the, the erection of tents in the memory, of course, of the, the Shis who were killed in 680 at the Battle of Karbala. And those tents were burned and there are ceremonial burnings of tents today in a way that is like the destruction of the, the monument itself, and of course the use of tear gas there mimics the smoke of Jaime Suzi or the ritual burning of tents in Shi ceremonies. So I'd love to hear a little bit more of your thoughts on um, the, the, the Shi angle of this monument. So thank you very much for your two very inspirational talks. Next. Thank you, Christian, for, for those remarks and, and connecting uh, Elizabeth and I in conversation, I'm sure. Hopefully, after we answer these questions, we'll open it up um, and, and, and talk be between ourselves and in our paper, because I was also jotting down things that, that I found uh, that, you know, some similarities. Um, in terms of your, your two questions, I, I want to begin with the male viewer one, because I think that's a good way to transition to the progression of, of abstraction, and, and I'll get to what I mean by that. I wasn't able to, to go into too much detail, so thank you for allowing me to do that now about um, kind of the, the very specific gendered rhetoric that, that we see um, through the national discourse that, that has been surrounded Egypt and continues to do so. And if we're just going to use that one image as an example, if a male viewer would pass, you, you know, the, the graffiti on, on the street, um, excuse me, on, on the floor, rather, um, and is being evoked to think about his own sister and, and mother in, in, a, in a way and uh, in a way that that would want to um, incite kind of action within him, or almost anger in, in a sort to, to, to be able to, to not even accept that this is something that could happen to, to, to his mother and his sister. I think, I think that reaction is, is, is stronger um, and is, is meant to elicit something that is, that, that is surrounded um, through a protective rhetoric, but I, but I, don't, I don't think it's it's only protecting them as much as it's also protecting himself, and not only his, it's, it's not the same honor uh, that we that we hear of generally as you know the male patriarch wanting wanting to, to protect you know the women in the family. Um, it speaks I think it speaks more to that, um, and and that is definitely something I know that I could elaborate more on on the paper as as I work towards it. But it it becomes honor in in the form of dignity almost, and, and dignity not just as a brother or a son. Um, 
I think that's where it starts. Uh, but but it leads into you know the dignity of of, of of him as a human being, thinking of the fact that he's almost he's almost crippled um, because he could not uh, or or maybe is unable to protect um, people that that is dearest to him. Um, and when you're thinking about the national kind of female gendered rhetoric in that form, I think I think that's where the transitional moment of, of rupturing can happen um, because. You know, the, the male figures of, of the country is actually is, is, is not the protective one anymore. Um, and so then the citizens themselves have to fulfill that role, be it male or, or female. Um, and going to uh, the second question, what we do have in that image, since we're talking about that one of, of the abstracted kind of blue amorphous bodies on, on the floor, that, that has a specific meaning. It has a specific meaning because um, it still tries to reference the photograph. You still see, you still see the, the bodily forms, although you know, the, the details are missing. Um, and then it has a specific meaning of the text. And so when you do see the progression of the abstraction of the blue bra, I think you know, the, the continuous kind of signification that happens and the added meaning and layers of meaning that, that exist could really only exist once it becomes you know, just the simple blue bra. Um, because you could play around with what you put next to it, around it, how, how, how you're using it. So if Bahia Shahab, for example, had placed her, um, stenciled her 51 children on the street next to, next to that one image on the floor, or next to the mural that I showed you in Muhammad Mahmoud, there, there won't be indirect conversation at, at that point. You know, that is its own meaning. You have, you have the soldiers engaging with the woman in, in a violent way. The children next to it, um, would, would stand on its own. I mean, you could try to put them in conversation, but I think it becomes a lot stronger and a lot clearer and a very different narrative is presented when you just have the blue bra um, and you fill it then with meaning. So the image is on its own, just the three soldiers and the women, you know, you're extracting meaning, right? I mean, they become devils, they become these monstrous figures. I mean, you're extracting all these meanings that the artist is, is giving you to extract, but when it's just the simple blue bra stencil, you have to add meaning to it. So the fact that, that it's abstracted and um, amorphous and, 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 and almost figureless, I mean, you could, you could see that it's just you know, an, an object that is being represented. But when, when you begin filling them, that's when the, it becomes more specifically suggestive, I think, of, of women's breasts, where before that, that meaning wasn't there. And when you're, when you're adding things next to it or around it and text, um, more layers of meaning than, than are, are presented. So I hope that answers. Oh, your very question. much. Thank you. Okay, yes. Thank you. <laughs> um, yes, thank you again for your questions. And I look forward to talking to you more also about um, your project. Um, going to, just going straight to the, the she issue, um, there are many aspects of the, the uprising in Bahrain in which um, she is, as the majority population of Bahrain is she, it was a majority she uprising. Yet, is that because it's majority of Bahrainis are she, or just because of other instances, is a question that's being debated right now by scholars. Um, and so to start from the beginning of the uprising, um, it was a youth um, sort of collective that occupied the roundabouts, not necessarily um, a majority Shi or Sunni, and there were many Sunnis in the beginning. Um, and some of the organizers that came in were some of these Shi organizational groups which actually help run these processions during Muharram. Um, from the Matans or Husseinis, and they were the ones who brought the food carts and who brought um, the tent sites to be able to encourage the campsite to happen at the roundabout. So it wasn't necessarily a Shi occupation, but the Shi infrastructure for street processions and other aspects were the ones helping facilitate the occupation in the beginning. And as the occupation went on, um, the, the groups began to take over more control and um, there are studies that many Sunnis did feel like they were being pushed away also because of what the monarchy, the, the regime wanted, which was to exploit the divide between Sunnis and Shis to turn them against each other so that they could then blame the uprising as a strictly Shi uprising, mostly being instigated by Iran, which is Saudi Arabia and Bahrain's um, number one uh, enemy in the Gulf. Um, and then talking about performativity um, in Shi uh, religious um, material culture, I think uh, you you said it um, you said it um, better probably than I could how these 
um, the cats that appear like tents are being implemented, just being inserted directly into these processions, which are linked back to um, mourning the Bow of Karbala. And for those of you who don't know, the Bow of Karbala happened in the 7th century and is seen as the event that really solidified the divide between Sunni and Shia Muslims. And so these processions are a way of memorializing and honoring the dead from that battle of Imam Hussein's followers. And so I think by seeing how the monument has so easily been taken and inserted and, and, and added to these sort of public mourning apparatus, we're seeing a collapse then between the 2011 uprisings and the Battle of Karbala as well. So we're seeing a collapse historically all the way back, not just the previous uprisings, there were major uprisings in Bahrain in the 1990s and 1970s, but all the way back to the 7th century. So we're seeing it added to this long historical discourse of um, the Shis in Bahrain as seeing themselves as victims um, being persecuted by a, a, a sort of a ruling Sunni elite. So we're seeing that stretch back into the past, which I, I think is absolutely fascinating. Mm -hmm. There's still a lot more work to be done. There's so much to discuss about the, the Shi elements um, with the monument as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I'd like to now open uh, the floor for some questions. Yes, Carol. I have a, also a microphone. Um, if, I can hear you. Can everybody hear? But let me, let me bring you the microphone. <laughs> Let's see if it works. Yes, there we go. First of all, thank you. Wonderful papers, really stimulating. Um, I had a question, I actually have a, a reaction, like a, a response, and, and, uh, and then an association, primarily for Nama. I couldn't help, my, my own reaction to, to being here in the audience and having the images there was that by the time you got to the image of the, the one that was on the wall with the, with the ones with the horns um, and the painting over of, of, of the exposed breast, I was relieved. Right? I was relieved, and I wasn't paying, I was listening to what you were saying, but I, I realized that um, uh, there was a discomfort at having the sustained image exposed uh, uh, because, of course, you know, once signs are out, they can be consumed in ways that, you know, in, in all kinds of ways. And of course, the, pre the prevalent ways that these have been consumed is, as you've all pointed out, talk back, um, exposing w what's been done and inciting uh, people to, to action. But, I just, just because of my own reaction to that, I, I also realized there is, I couldn't help but think of other ways that, that you know, problematic ways that the image, not, not here necessarily in this room, but it, in, other, it, in its wide dissemination, the photograph itself, of it being consumed in ways that were, um, you know, problematic, I'll put it that way. And even, even noticing in the progression, as you were going towards, from the photograph to abstraction, along the way, there was actually one of the images before the before the ones with the uh, the horns. There was one that actually made the bra and the breast more voluptuous. That actually painted it in a more voluptuous way, which was sort of star startly, even though that's not what we were focusing on. So that maybe it's part of what called my attention to the possibility of problematic consumption of, of, of that image. And it couldn't I couldn't it couldn't help but associate with me to the you know, the, the hundreds and hundreds of images old Orientalist, the colonial harem, those kinds of images that deliberate, that, that very specifically get fixated on the image of, oh my goodness, look, see, the veiled woman can be exposed, right? And all those, those hundreds of images that were precisely that kind of uh, manipulation of, of, of veiled, you know, covered women with just the breast exposed. So it felt like it, it uncomfortably fit into that kind of, um, uh, seen a string of associations. So just, it was just, I'm just sharing my reaction and asking if, you, if, you, if that occurred to you along the way, which I'm sure it did. Um, and secondarily, just the, the thing about calling, the, the call to the uh, uh, brothers and the fathers to, to protect their, their, their uh, wives and sisters, uh, or, or daughters in other cases, obviously with, with the nation so uh, ubiquitously associated with women, not, not just in Arab nationalism, but other contexts, it's not surprising, but it just also associated for me with, in the Palestinian context, the, you know, the very famous evoking of Palestine as the raped bride on her wedding night, and specifically calling for um, the men to sort of shame the men into action, like how can you stand by and watch this rape, and it's very much appealing to that kind of protective, and you know, in a, in a very masculinist uh, context of, of nationalist discourse, so comment on any of that. Um, thank you, Carol, for, for those uh, very uh, kind of stimulating uh, 
comments, I, 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 I would have to agree with you. I do think that the image is problematic, and I don't have, um, and I, I did not discuss it in that terms. And, and partly, it, and the reason why I, I didn't, and, um, and I hope you could all kind of excuse the fact that I, I did not, I'm still grappling with what to do with that, and it first occurred to me that it could be problematic, not necessarily in the context that you presented, so I'm, I'm not really going to respond about to the, um, to the uncomfortable fitting of Orientalist uh, discourse because I'm, I'm, still, I'm not really sure how, how it ties in, in in this specific context. I think it depends on audience and how the image is discussed. But it first occurred to me that the image is consumed in a problematic way when I was looking at transnational feminist discourse. Um, because I think that's a component here that I, that I didn't get to talk to in the presentation, but definitely in my paper. There are a lot of um, white women feminists who wear the blue bra and expose themselves in that way, trying to stand in solidarity. Yes, I have lots of pictures <laughs> of that, or, or just other white feminists um, trying to bring to light, kind of, in, in a savior rhetoric, look what is happening to this, to, to this which is interesting because the, an orientalist discourse does the opposite, right? You're removing it, but here the removal is, is more of, um, of, 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 a, of a problematic solidarity. Um, the comment that you had on the one image that had the, the breast a little bit more um, kind of drawn in a different way, I think, that, I think that was the one on the mural I noticed, and that was the one that was covered up. Um, or was it the, the, the two different ones? It was the first one. I'll have to take a closer look to that, um, to specifically. I mean, the other things that come up with, you know, just the photograph, and I think, you know, you could present on just the photograph without the responses, but I was really interested in, in, in the talking back aspect, um, is, is just the idea of body image, right? I mean, she, what would have happened if it was, it was a different type of body that was um, kind of beaten in this way, and what is that? And how, how do you then talk about, you know, the exposure in, in, in ways that does not fall into, the, into those same rhetorics? Um, and the idea of shaming the citizens into doing something, I, I'm sure that's an underlying tone, but it's not as, it's not as explicit in these responses um, anyways. But I thank you for that. Um, I also deliberately put that first image on, it's, it's longer. We see it, I think, for a good 10 minutes before um, as, as a form of uncomfortness because, you know, we really don't feel what she's going through except by being uncomfortable by, by the image, and it also adds to the afterlife of it. Um, I think the photograph is not being consumed in the same way today as it was two years ago. Um, so even the forms of consumption has, has definitely varied. But uh, thank you for adding more thoughts to my paper. Sorry, did you had something you wanted to say? I was going to say the second one, the pants, she was painted over and her pants were blue instead, which uh, her pants were jeans. Or the jeans. I mean, that's another the thing that I think is part. interesting. Yeah. yeah um, I don't talk about the mundane or, or the everyday aspect of the image. I mean, she is wearing jeans, she is wearing tennis shoes. Uh, I was really just focused on, on the bra and the, and the abstraction um, to talk about the endless semi aspect. But, yeah, no. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Are there other questions? Yes. Uh, you're closest, Margaret. Yes. Okay. Let me try to reach you. Um, so, just to follow up on this one point. Um, before we leave it, thank you both. Um, wasn't it in Tahrir Square that there was this sort of epidemic of really of rape and real violations? The circles of hell. Well, I'm sorry. The circles of hell. That's what they were called. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So when you think about that in relation to the blue, to the blue bra, and it's it's prequel to rape as it comes across, at least to me. Um, how, how, how do you see the agency of the blue bra as an icon getting subverted into uh, you know, a kind of misogynistic backlash or something? What, what's the story there as you think of it, or if there is one at all, or is it not related to what this image did, in a sense? Thank you uh, for that, but again, I think we have to we have to be specific with um, how we think about kind of the chronology. And so, as of yet, and again, being there this summer, other other signs have have resurfaced, especially after um, the Rabaul massacre in, in August that, that just occurred. So the the blue bra has 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 almost 
I don't want to say died out because it still lives on, and if, if anything, it lives on through me speaking about it in a way. But it was, again, it was a moment in time in which, you know, Bahia made that stencil and, and placed it next to the children. And, um, so I do not think it has been subverted to, to, to mean anything misogyn from a misogynistic perspective. But, I mean, that is definitely something I'm willing to, you know, to think about. So I thank you for that. Um, in, in response to the circles of hell, you know, that was happening, that was again happening, I mean, you, you have these rape cases throughout, you know, in, in, from 2011 and, until uh, 2012, uh, and, and even going into 2013. So, so it's not a new thing, but that moment was really a counter-revolutionary moment. Um, and so the, the act of rape, you know, in any type of war, we know that immediately, you know, soldiers rape, rape any, and in Bosnia, we, we hear, in Serbia, we hear, we, hear, we, we hear this narrative on and on again that, you know, the first thing to do to cripple the nation's citizens is, is to have the soldiers rape the women. Um, and so in the, in the Egyptian context, it was, we don't know, I don't know, maybe somebody in the audience um, can tell us who exactly was doing the raping, um, if it were just regular citizens or thugs or, or, or even male soldiers dressed as, as ordinary citizens, because we, we, we've seen kind of the police camouflage themselves in protests. Um, but, but again, that speaks to, to, to the fear of and, and disciplining uh, people in a way uh, that is counter-revolutionary to, to the goal. I, I don't know if that answers your question, um, but right now I don't see a direct link between the blue bra and, and those cases. At least it hasn't appeared um, visually anyways. Uh, thanks to both of you for really interesting presentations. I, uh, I, wanted, I had a question about the uh, Bahrain paper. Um, it, it seemed to me that there was a sort of tension between the national and the regional that ran underneath uh, your presentation. And, and this, is, this question is going to take you a little bit outside the specific political context you were working on. But uh, I haven't been to Bahrain, but I do remember in a trip to Kuwait going to a museum of the history of pearl diving that featured this very large monumental though or the, one of these sailboats from which you do the pearl diving. And so I'm, I'm curious about um, this image, the pearl, the pearl monument that emerged from a regional summit and yet was supposed to stand in as a sign of local authenticity, perhaps even as a national icon, and yet it's a national icon that sort of can be simultaneously claimed by a bunch of different nations. And so I was curious if you could speak a little bit more to the state to, to the sort of function of the nation within your analysis, be it specifically the nation state, the, the monarchy, or the nation as sort of collective identity um, with regards to the pearl and how that icon circulates in a bunch of different neighboring contexts. Yeah, absolutely, thank you, that's a fantastic question. As you know, there's roundabouts all up and down the Gulf, and at those roundabouts, there are other sculptures of pearls. There's one, I know, um, in another part of um, the Emirates where it's a clam with an actual pearl inside. So you find these all along, I and mean, you see the vow. I mean, they're, they're in Oman, I see them sail by, and there's also some pearl-like sort of references or symbols in Oman, and then as you speak of in Kuwait. Um, I think the, the argument I want to make about sort of the localizing aspect of the Pearl Monument within this transnational Gulf Collective is that it's the only instance that I know of in which it is a transnational monument. It's a memorial to a summit of all six GCC nations, and yet it's also been um, sort of historicized as a national monument. It was used on postage stamps. It was actually on one of the, the 500, um, the largest coin in Bahrain had the Pearl Monument on it and that's been removed from circulation since then. So they've erased as many traces as possible of any evidence of the pro monument as this uh, part of a government propaganda, sort of historicizing campaign. So my argument comes also from what the government was, how they were wielding the monument in the roundabout as a, as a symbol of, of the nation as well. And so that's sort of what I wanted to try and convey. But you're absolutely right that pearling was pervasive throughout the Gulf. Um, so it's fascinating that Bahrain, um, the government before the Tuzlum uprising, fixate on that as sort of their own identity um, versus the other countries. Hi, um, thank you so much for speaking to us about all these different images. Um, my question's for Inanna, and I was sort of curious about the notion of covering up of these different images. 
Um, specifically, the image I guess that we were speaking about earlier of how when you when someone went and added the horns and things like that, they chose to actually cover up the blue bra, and she no longer was seen wearing it. And it sort of reminded me of a lot of the moments when female political candidates were being covered up by different salafists and putting like the flowers on their face and sort of those moments. Do you think that there is some sort of necessity or desire to cover her or bring her dignity or some sort of relationship there? Or what do you sort of feel was the reasoning for simultaneously disfiguring the soldiers but then also choosing to cover up the iconic image? Um, thank you. What's actually really interesting about that one image, um, I mean, I took it this past summer, and so I'm still kind of looking at it and reflecting and, and walking away and, and trying to figure it out. But her, they only covered the blue bra. They didn't cover her abdomen. I mean, her stomach is still bare. You know, they, they didn't veil her back in, in any other way. Um, and so it's definitely not a matter of, of bringing her... I don't know. I, I can't say that it's not a matter of bringing back her dignity, right? Because you would, if, 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 if someone really wanted to do that, then why not just cover her entire body? Which, I mean, she was covered before she was attacked. Um, so, I mean, part, part of our, our kind of struggle as scholars, and, and, and because of my art background, I feel like sometimes, you know, we, as, as a scholar, I read too much into why somebody did something, and sometimes artists don't have that same um, kind of thought process. Most of the time, you know, they do, and there's a reason. Uh, I feel like I'm really not giving, in, like, the, your, your, your question a good answer, but I, I don't know. Um, I don't know why they decided to just cover the bra in red. And, and in red, I mean, red is such a bold color that symbolizes, you know, like, death and blood. I mean, um, and, and even, the, like, the devil, right? If the soldiers are becoming devils, why, why cover? Maybe it could also just bring attention to what happened to her um, with just that pop of color. Maybe the blue wasn't doing it for them. Um, so I, I don't know. Yeah, I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you both very much for such stimulating uh, research and papers. I wish you good luck on the ground as you continue. Uh, let us take a 15 minute break and reconvene at 11 o'clock uh, for Wael Abbas's talk. And also there is tea and coffee <laughs> in the East Conference Room, which is right uh, to the right down the hallway. So please join us. We do have uh, some, some uh, uh, edibles and potables. So, so thank you once again to you both for your patience.